Welcome to the Avail Leadership Podcast, where our goal is to help you take your leadership to the next level. My name is Virgil Sierra, and today we're connecting with Brenda Chand. Brenda is the co-founder of Dream Releaser Coaching and has a heart for generosity. Together, we'll discuss the art of generosity and how being generous can truly make a difference. Let's get started. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Avail Leadership Podcast. My name is Virgil Sierra. I'm the Avail Media host. Uh, I'm also the lead pastor of Vertical Church, aka Iglesia Vertical in South Florida, where we are one church, two languages. And as always, we are here with another amazing leader who is going to share a lot of insight with us. Uh, Avail Leadership never disappoints, and our heart is to provide practical relevant leadership content for today's Christian leader. So I hope that you're ready for a great episode today. I have the privilege and honor of connecting here with all of you with Brenda Chand, uh, who is a wife, a mother, a grandmother. Uh, Brenda and her husband, Dr. Sam, co-founded Dream Releaser Coaching, which is a program designed to equip, equip future coaches with the knowledge and information they need to succeed in the industry. Uh, also, Brenda has done a lot of work co-authoring and working as an adjunct instructor at BHU, teaching courses such as Laws of Leadership, Spiritual Formation, and Leadership Coaching. There's a wealth of knowledge and experience. Brenda, we are so happy to have you here with us on the Avail Leadership Podcast. How are you feeling? I'm doing great. I'm so, so excited and so honored to be with you, Pastor Virgil. This is so good. Hey, I know that this conversation is going to be really insightful because I know we're going to talk about one of the topics that's really big in your heart, which is generosity. We're going to also delve a little bit into dream releaser coaching a little bit ahead. But before we do that, Brenda, this is a great opportunity for the Avail Leadership uh, family to just get to know a little bit more about you. Can you tell us a little bit about you? We know because we hear about you all the time, Dr. Sam Chan and a lot of his teachings and a lot of his videos. He talks about Brenda, my wife, Brenda. And I know why, because you're an amazing woman, an amazing leader, but we want to hear from you. Tell us a little bit about your story. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, my journey began, I was uh, brought up in a home where there was extreme poverty. I, um, to the point that there was no indoor plumbing at times or no electricity. So very, very extreme poverty. A uh, lot of physical and emotional abuse went on in the home. Um, a lot of dysfunction. But all of that aside, uh, uh, that was the way I was brought up. Uh, I was brought up where I had the responsibility of working and doing household responsibilities by a very young age, by the time I was five or six years old. Um, there were times that we would be running for our life in the middle of the night because uh, one of the parent, one of my parents was alcoholic and just kept mm. us in fear all the time. And we would just run out in the middle of the night um, just thinking that, you know, he w was after us, that we could be killed, um, mm -hmm. that type of thing. So it was nothing to just be waking up and just go out in the middle of the night. Um Wow. Just running. So that was the way I grew up. As you fast forward that, um, I became a Christian at the age of 18. I had some earlier experiences, but didn't, to understand what I was doing and, and everything at the age of 18 when I graduated from high school. And um, so at, at that age, I heard about a place called Beulah Heights University in Atlanta, Georgia. And I wasn't allowed to go to college. So um I thought, I want I want to do that. And I had this dream. And at, so at the age of 20, I just um, defied my parents and, and went to Beulah Heights University and just said, I'm mm. gone, which, you know, at the age of 20, you should be doing something. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> but all that time when I was going through all those things as a child, it's like a Cinderella story. It was like, um, yeah, I was in that world, but I had another world that was a dream world. And I dreamed that, you know, I could do things. Um, if you ever saw Cinderella, the original virgin, version, there's a song in it that says, in my own little corner, in my own little world, I can be whatever I want to be. 
Mm. And so in that dream world of mine, I dreamed that uh, somebody loved me. Someone saw value in me because I didn't see any value in myself. Wow. You know, I would get whacked for doing the wrong thing, only I didn't know what the wrong thing was. Mm. Um, so, you, you know, you could just be minding your own business and get whacked for seemingly nothing. Mm. And um, so I dreamed that I would find somebody that would see some value in me and that I would be the center of their world. And I dreamed that I would um, be an adult with lots of money that I could give to other people, that uh, money was would not be an issue. Mm. And I'm not saying that I'm there, but, you know, that was my dream. Yeah. And so many of those dreams that I had, um, one, a couple of years ago, I was like, we had about 30 people come into the house and I was stuffing uh, Christmas cards with hundred dollar bills. And I was like, wow, that's my dream from childhood, you wow. know, that I could be giving people that kind of money. It's not a lot of money, but you know, when you got 30 of them, you know, it's, it, it, it adds up. So one of my dreams, when I, went away and finally went away to college from Michigan to Atlanta, Georgia. So it was, it was a long ways on top of just deciding I'm going to go to college. No one on our family had been to college. In fact, my father lived during the depression and he had a third grade education. Mm. And, um, but he, you know, his life was the same way. He grew up in extreme poverty um, where he left that left home at the age of 18 or left home at the age of 12. Mm -hmm. uh, his father was in, in prison for uh, uh, bootlegging during the prohibition. Mm -hmm. So he got out, he stole, he I heard of him living in camps with men where he would work the same as a man at the age of 12 years old. And so that's the way he grew up. So, you know, when we came along, it was like, you know, you contribute to the family, you know, everybody works. Right. Everybody pulls their load. Doesn't matter if you're five, six, eight years old, you pull your load. Um, so I came from that into in college. No one had ever graduated in my family from um, college. And so I came, I told everybody, well, I'm going to go down for one semester and then I'm going to go on with my ministry because I felt called into ministry. Um, I'm going to go, going to go, I'm going to be a missionary, just completely give my life over to God, let him use me, do whatever he wanted to do. And that's where I met Sam. That's where I met my husband. And he came from India. I came from Michigan. And we met at Beulah Heights. And it was during a crisis time in my life that he became my best friend. Uh, I was devastated one day about something personal that was going on. And, and he, we had been friends for a while. And he came to me and he said, don't worry, I'm going to be here for you. I'm, I'm going to be here. I'll never leave you. And even though we went through a lot of things, deciding whether or not to get married, um, he went back to India for 15, 18 months, went through a lot of things. We remained best friends and ultimately married in 1979. So these were dreams that I had. And um, he always treated me like the center of his world. Um, he always provided for me and he was always always they always there for me so that's a little bit in a nutshell a little bit of my story and so i just had those dreams and i get to see them come come true daily really wow you know thank you for sharing that i think i can imagine um as a ch you know considering the childhood experience that you had you know in the circumstances i can imagine at times it might even have felt hopeless you know am i always going to kind of be in this situation um, and, and, you know, your story is, is, a, is an important story, uh, because I think there's people that can relate with that, um, Brenda. So thank you for sharing that. Um, here's, here's my first question that I want to jump into, because I think, I think there's something powerful through what you experienced kind of growing up, then, you know, Christ comes into your life, your life, you know, changes there significantly. Um, and then you make these decisions that, that were big decisions in, in your life. And then kind of fast forwarding and looking ahead, coming from uh, extreme poverty, um, experiencing, you know, all these steps in your journey, and then having moments in your life, like the one you mentioned a little while ago, being able to bless people, you know, you know, with, with a great blessing. 
Um, this whole issue of generosity. What what does generosity mean to you? If you if you just talked about it, summed it up, what is generosity to you? Well, I'm very passionate about generosity. Um, I love giving. I think it's giving in all kinds of ways, but we kind of look at, we can divide things up into time, talent, and treasure. That's what we have. That's really all that's ours to, to mm-hmm. whatever we're gifted with, whatever we're given. Um, so generosity to me is just going above and beyond what's expected of you, going that step beyond when someone asks you of something, uh, that act of kindness. And it's it's the opposite of selfishness, which selfishness is what can I get? What can I have? Mm. Um, what's in it for me? My I had a professor um, in college who said, we're all tuned into WIFM radio. What's in it for me? <laughs> so that's the opposite of generosity. And I look at, I have a grandchild story about generosity. <laughs> My little seven-year-old granddaughter, to me that she's, She's pure, innocent, spontaneous, and just the picture of generosity. And that little girl, when she hears that we're having a family gathering for a birthday or something like that, she just goes to work. She will get out her art supplies and she'll start creating crafts and she'll run into her bedroom, which she has one here and she has one at her home, um, She'll run into her room and she'll just find things. And sometimes it's nothing but a penny. I remember one time she gave my husband, Sam, 30 cents. And she's, he said, am I keeping her 30 cents? And I said, you've got to keep her 30. You've got to keep her 30 cents. She's got to learn how to give and um, enjoy experience that, that giving. The story that happened this past year that, that's so near and dear to my heart is um but it, it was Debbie's birthday, my daughter, Debbie Chan. And so she started that hunt for something that she could give. And I had an envelope on my desk that was her birthday money from months ago, and we had not deposited it yet. And um, so she looked through there, and it's quite a bit of cash. So she she picked out two $100 bills, and she put them in Debbie's card for her birthday. And again, Debbie, she gave it to Debbie for her birthday. And she said, Debbie said, I can't take her money. And I said, well, you can't not take it. So you just put it aside for a while and give it back to me later. And it'll go into her account. But it's just that innocence and that spontaneity of just wanting to give what you've got. And I asked her what she wants. Because we we do better for our grandkids than we did for our kids. We have a, a bank account for our kids, which... Um, when she has a birthday or something, we'll put a hundred, a couple hundred dollars in it instead of buying these needless toys and things of that nature, you know? <laughs> yeah. And so ask her, what do you want for your birthday? And she says, I don't want anything. I don't need anything. And it, and one day I called her, I said, look how much money you have in your account. And she said, I don't need that. I don't. So just that innocence, that that is generosity. That is pure giving. That's beautiful. You know, now that you're talking about that, um, it seems to me that you didn't see much generosity happening in your childhood. Would that be safe to say? Yeah. Did you, did you, when did you, when did it catch your attention? If if maybe you didn't see this normally modeled in your childhood, I'm just curious, uh, Brenda, because I think, I know in my life, I can look back and remember just seeing people being generous, like you said, with their time, being generous with their with their finances, with their resources. Can you remember a, a, a moment, maybe, of seeing something, or um, you know, in your in your journey with with Dr. Sam? You know, is there a moment where you just realized, man, being generous really is a blessing? Mm. I think I kind of had to teach Sam to be generous. No, <laughs> <laughs> um, I I don't think of a single single moment. It was just that dream that I had that of seeing all the lack around me growing up. I mean, we, as a family, uh, my sister and I especially, and then there were three younger than the, than the two of us, would go to school and our clothes would be just horrible, just something you wouldn't want to send your kids to school in. And mm. we didn't want that for the ones that were younger. So we worked really hard and just gave our money, whatever we made, 
to uh, help it so it wouldn't be like that for them. That, so that's I, good. That's a good example. Oh, were you gonna were you gonna add something else there? Uh, um, no, just seeing all that lack. You know, we just didn't want them to go through the yeah. same thing we had to go through. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that my wife and I try to try to teach our kids we have we have a two middle schoolers and an elementary school, um, and it's, it's just what it you know what generosity is, but also identifying what selfishness is. Um, how does selfishness inhibit generosity? Uh, another kind of tag along question: Should you give with expectations? Uh, what would you speak into that? Well. You know, of course, when you're always thinking of what's in it for me, you know, that's um, that inhibits. And also, oh, I did want to make a disclaimer up front that I've probably very rarely, if ever, given anything with the right motive. I feel like mm. that I give and you want people to appreciate and you want people to thank you. You want to make sure they know that you did it, that uh. type of thing. And so. I try to root out all of that stuff, and I think I'm finally pretty close, but I'm still not sure that I'll make any rewards in heaven for my generosity, even though giving is a passion of mine and something that I love to do. I love that. You, you know, I'll, I'll just I'll just add into the conversation here that um, I think in the last, probably in about the last uh, eight to 10 years, the Lord has really worked uh, in me and my family, me and my wife, um, just the developing that generosity. And it's funny because I feel, I don't know if you would agree, but the more you do it, like the more you activate generosity, <laughs> the more you, mm -hmm. the, the, it kind of becomes even fun. Um, it, it's exciting. Would you agree with that? Oh yes, absolutely. Uh, it's just something that Sam and I love to do and we've done it together so many times. Um, I looked at some hallmarks of generous people and I, they're spontaneous. They can't help themselves but give. Huh. They always see the need. Um, my husband um, and I was jokingly said, you know, I had to teach him to be generous, but I think he taught me to be generous. Um, we were, we've been, it seems like when I tell my stories, it's like we're in the restaurant all the time, but we do <laughs> eat out too much. Um, but we were in a restaurant not too long ago and a waitress dropped uh, a big plate of dishes and, and several of them broke. So we talked to her and he said, do you have to pay for that when that happens? And she explained that she did and because it was her fault. And um, so he gives her a hundred dollars, you know, and um, so she starts crying and she comes back to us and she said, I was wondering how I was going to give my little girl a birthday party this year. And then we were in another restaurant and someone did this old thing where they, you do the dine and dash where uh -huh. <laughs> you eat your food and then you say, Oh, I forgot my wallet. Let me run to the car, you know, the dine and dash thing. And, and so again, the same thing happened. We asked the waitress, do you have to pay for the bill when something, yes. When we let something like that, we have to pay the bill. Wow. The other day I got stuck with a $95 bill um, that I had to pay. And so, he paid that and she asked us 50 times, are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Mm -hmm. You know, kind of thing. So uh, generous people, they see a need and they fill it. And we've, like you said, we've had so much fun doing it. <laughs> um, one day we were in a restaurant again. Uh, <laughs> it was at Christmas time and there was this young woman and she was great with child. And I, I said to my husband, um, she might be a single mom, Let's, you know, so we gave her a hundred dollars. And so it's a waffle house where we always go. And so um, we looked and there was a waitress that you, we get a lot of times. And I said, well, we can't give her a hundred dollars without giving her a hundred dollars. So we gave her a hundred dollars. And so then the cook was the only one left in the room. So we gave him a hundred dollars. And so my husband looks up and said, is there anybody in the back room? <laughs> and there was no one fortunate for us, but you know, <laughs> it's just so much fun to do. And we have fun and we don't give with the idea of getting anything back. We used mm -hmm. to give loans once in a while, not that we have money to burn, but we used to give loans once in a while to people mm -hmm. and they just simply could not pay us back or didn't, you know? Mm -hmm. And so now if someone asks us to borrow money, we say, no, 
but you can have whatever, you know. So we wow. did with no expectations of any return. Yeah, I find I find that's, these are great examples. I find that people are often surprised. You know, like you said, they ask, "Are you sure?" I think it's uncommon mm-hmm. to just see uh, generosity, especially extravagant generosity. And I would say that's extra. You know, you want things to give a couple extra bucks when you're thankful. You know, to a waiter or a waitress. But but you know, being extravagantly generous, I think, is something. Uh, that is so uncommon that it really catches uh, people's attention. So I, I love the example that you guys are setting as you, as you do that. Um, now, one of the things that is also true, Brenda, is that you and and uh, Dr. Sam, you know, you you you're leading a lot of people in the different organizations uh, that you are involved with. Um, if if you're thinking about employees and people that are working, you know, uh, under your leadership, what are some ways that organizations can be generous towards their employees? Do you have any uh, examples or any thoughts? Because I think that a lot of, a lot of us leaders that are leading people, whether it's ministry, church, you know, marketplace, um, we, we sometimes forget about that. You know, we, 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 we consider payroll, you know, we, we do, you know, the normal daily business, but, you know, maybe going an extra, going the extra mile of being generous in, in different ways. What are some thoughts and ideas? Okay. Um, I think, you know, it's like the adage uh, or the saying, you know, happy, happy wife, happy life. <laughs> and uh, so I was trying to think of something that rhymed, happy staff, happy something, but I didn't uh-huh. come up with a word that rhymes <laughs> with it. Happy staff, whether they're volunteer or paid, um, will make, create a happy environment. Yeah. Uh, make happy customers, make happy management, um, and ultimately happy uh, stakeholders and, and owners, you know. I think if we focus on the development and happiness of those that we that work around us, um, then everybody else is going to, it's going to trickle down. Hmm. And so if our, if our focus is on helping them to, to reach their dreams and their vision and their personal development, then they're going to be happy and, and make the people happy around them. And so I actually um, went on the internet a while back and, and was looking at things that companies do to um, make their, make it more employee centric, make the employees more content and happy to work with them. And I found so many things and these were pre COVID things. Now, mm-hmm some of the things are fulfilled out of necessity, but at the time it was just what people were doing and, and uh, things like they always make sure that something up, there's an upcoming event that they got something to look forward to. They've got a lunch to look forward to. They got a mm. event to look forward to. They got a monthly celebration of some type to look forward to. So give them something to look forward to um, give them permission to go the extra mile. Okay. Because sometimes employees are so busy, they can't uh, have time to to deal with their coworkers or the customer that's in front of them. They've just got to keep moving and keep going. Uh, so give them permission to go that extra mile. Give them empowerment. Mm. Um, if they need to replace something or or whatever, but just empower them to be good to people. That's good. They need the flexibility and the time. Um, Make sure whoever you're hiring fits into your culture, for one thing. Um, yeah. Make sure employees are convinced of a, a larger purpose or goal that, that the company may have. Um, do something that matters in the world. Do a 5K together. Um, str- uh, strive for happiness and fulfillment in the employee. Try to make sure employees like each other. You know, don't allow... Yeah. Don't don't allow confusion and um, bickering or that type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, tr- try to make sure employees like each other. Um, offer health health club memberships. These are some of the things I found online. Yeah, good idea. Um, massages, <laughs> personal training, <laughs> regular breaks. I mean, you need to relax when you're on the job too. Uh, free refreshments, stock kitchens a sense of well-being, uh, flat organization 
and that's where they would have little to, little or no management levels of management that they would have to go through mm. uh, an organic structure flexible vacations attractive office space catered meals guest lecturers and allow for this is where the covid comes in allow for we work and life balance mm. where, you know if you've got to do something with your family with your child um you allow for something like that because I've seen plenty where you don't allow. I saw even one site where they said had on-site laundry where you could do your laundry on site. And I thought, wow, if I would have done that when I was working, <laughs> working out, uh, if I told my boss, I got to, I got to go throw the clothes in the dryer, you know, <laughs> I wonder what he, what he would have said. Um, and so just on and on, there's, there's so much that, that can be done, but you just look around and see what you have to work with. I love that. I think, I think it's great because one of the things, as you were sharing some ideas and thoughts there, you know, um, there's generosity doesn't come in one size and shape or exactly. color, you know, there, you know, there's moments where maybe as a, as a, as a business leader, as a ministry leader, organizational leader, you, maybe you do have the ability to have a, 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 a spe, an extravagant generosity moment with your staff, you know, but sometimes just just knowing details. I remember with our staff here at Vertical Church, uh, we, we had them fill out just kind of favorites, like what's your favorite coffee drink? What's your favorite candy bar? What's your favorite, you know, snack? Things like that. So that every once in a while, uh, you know, we just surprise them on their desk when they get to work. Th- things like that, we, you know, uh, that just allows uh, people to feel I was thought of. And, and, and I guess that's kind of uh, one of the questions that I had for you. You mentioned about spontaneous generosity, right? You not, not necessarily planned. Can there be planned generosity? Is that something you've experienced? Um, of, yes, of course. You've got to give it some thought. You've got to be ready uh. for that. And I think in your own personal finances, you've got to plan plan your finances so that you can mm-hmm. build in generosity into that. Um, for for ourselves, we have our own personal core values for finances. And I had, I had to write these for one of my classes, to be honest. And then in our coaching program, I have everybody to write their financial core core values as well. And it's very simple. And, you know, we all have core values, whether we realize it or not, Mm -hmm. we act on core values all the time. And so how we spend our money, what we do has to be planned ahead. Um, But, we automatically do these things and they're automatically become our core values. Uh, whether they're good habits or bad habits, they're our core values. Yeah. And so I had to write mine out in this class. And so just jotting them down is to tithe on all income, which is 10% of your income, integrity and in paying bills. So you get, to, you get your bills paid on time. You keep, your, mm-hmm. you keep your promises but owe no one anything. That's what we try to live by, except to love one another. Um, realize that everything we have is a gift, even our ability to make money. Save and and invest a predetermined amount. Live modestly, spend cautiously, and give the rest away. So, so you decide how much you're going to save, how much you're going to spend, and then if you if you have all of these written down or Maybe they're not written down, but you live by them. Um, And then it comes time to buy that house or that car. You're like, well, am I tithing? Have I saved? Have I done investments? Um, You know, how am I living? Can I afford it? And if all those tick the box, you know, and you can say yes to all of those things, then buy the car that you want or buy whatever it is you're looking at if you can say that you've done those things and you've saved, invested and so on. I like that. I like that. Having uh, financial, co- financial core values. I love that. I'm going to work on mine. And, you know, kind of what you mentioned is something that I learned. Um, I'm a big uh, uh, financial peace university, kind of Dave Ramsey follower myself. Yes. And I remember one of the things I always learned is generosity should be in your budget, you know? Yes. Um, and, and I think that's kind of what you're saying, you know, having it planned, having it in there, uh, I think that's a wonderful thing. Um, before we shift your directions a little bit, uh, Brenda, let me just ask you a little bit about kind of the current situation, right? The current situation coming out of 
a, a greatly disorienting year that was 2020, uh, a year filled with many twists and turns that were unexpected. Uh, and now here at the beginning of a, of a new year, 2021, how have you been navigating all of this uncertainty? Well, it's been life-changing, uh, first of all, to have my husband at home. Mm. Uh, my husband was in at least 200 flights a year, if not more. He was gone wow. days and sometimes weeks at a time. And then to have him kind of re-enter my day-to-day -day world. Now, there's parts of it I didn't like about that. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was kind of an independent free agent uh, and then he comes back into my world and he starts <laughs> like getting in my business all up in my business <laughs> and <laughs> a couple of examples um, you know he's gone I just do the next thing whatever that is if that's taking out the trash if that's you know uh, making large purchases I mean while he's been away I've had to trade cars. I've had to, you know, do all this on my own. Of course, I get him on the phone and I say, you know, what to say, what to do here. And, um, you know, power of attorney and all that thing, all the things you have to do when when someone's traveling or away like that. Mm -hmm. And he comes back and he's telling me, don't take the trash out. I'm taking the trash out every time. And, and then he'll go away, you know, for a few hours. And he comes back. I've taken out the trash. I told you I was taking out that trash you, and we have this <laughs> big hill that you've got to navigate through, you know, going down our drive. And I'm like, but I, I did it for 16, 20 years. You know, you're telling me to stop all of a sudden. Well, when I'm here, I'm telling you I'm doing that type of thing. So, you know, it, it's been really, really different. And then managing just the household things where, you know, I would call in a repair person or a, whatever the house needed, you know, and just managing things that he would come in. And um, now he's like, well, what are you doing that for? And, and, you know, it's just, that's, that part has been something else. And then, you know, we've had a lot of time together, which we've really, really, really enjoyed. Mm. And we've, we've done healthier things. We've, uh, you know, got it. We've got a better diet. We've got a better schedule. We, Hmm. Get a lot of sleep and rest and that type of thing. Um, so that's been really parts of it has, has been really, really good for us. But I, I miss church, I miss events, I miss, you know, and one of the biggest things we've lost um a number of people that are close to us, not to COVID, but uh a few a few to COVID and then some to other things, you know, life's hmm. life is life. So We've lost a lot of people, and it's been very difficult to celebrate their life the way you want to celebrate. I miss it right. so much. Our like our second mother, the person we told when we became engaged to get married, passed away, and we didn't get. Mm. We got to go to the funeral, but we didn't get to celebrate the way that she wanted everybody to. You know, she had assignments for everyone and all this type of thing, but not everyone got to come, and but we did, and just celebrate people and their life's accomplishments and give them tributes and you don't get to go do that you know um time after time people will you know pass and we don't get to do that type of thing so i miss all of those things and on the other hand we spend a lot of good time together i know all yeah. the roads in south georgia because that's all we get to do is go for rides <laughs> can't go see a good movie i'm dying to go see a good movie <laughs> one of these days yeah. So I'm trying to think how else it's changed. How it's, 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 it sounds like a lot of readjusting, right? A lot of just. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah. I think I think that that uh, in, in a season like this, uh, it, it, it helps, you know, to be able to talk through it and hey, navigate like what you're saying from the day to day in home family things to, you know, the organizational, you know, ministry leadership, you know, situations. But but it but it is there is readjusting. There's a little bit of give. There's a little bit of take. Um, you know, which which can be stressful. You know, and in some cases um, uh, magnify. I know that a lot of families and even marriages. Um, you know, this these circumstances magnify the amount of conflict. <laughs> you know, and the amount of yes. Uh, yes. stress. And and unfortunately, 
you know, when, when there's not a good foundation, a lot of, you know, challenges for the family, but, um, but it's, it sounds like that extra time has been good. Extra time with Dr. Sam being home has been, has been nice, uh, but also readjusting to, Hey, how are we going to yes. run things now? You know? And, and I think for every leader who's out there, that's been the story of, of this season. How do we readjust in the midst of all these circumstances. Okay, Brenda, I want to I want to ask you as a co-founder of Dream Releaser Coaching, what inspired uh, how was it born this whole idea of Dream Releaser Coaching? Well, in the midst of all of my husband's travels, I decided to um just not become totally independent but just be my own person. I went back to school at the age of 47. I uh, got my master's degree and ultimately my doctorate in 2012. And I was teaching at Beulah Heights University and they gave me a course um, in mentoring. And then, so I taught that several semesters and then the leadership chair wanted me to switch it over from coaching to um, from mentoring to leadership coaching. So mm. I ended up rewriting the, the course description and developing that course and getting the textbooks and all that comes with that. And so prior to that, in my master's program, I'd been introduced to coaching through a course. So I knew about coaching. And um, so then I, I started teaching it, I taught it from about 2000, uh, from 2002 till, till we started our business in 2010. Um, just teaching it, you know, for several semesters over and over again. And then I just had got passionate about, I want to start a business mm. and I want to start a business that will train coaches to become life coaches, train individuals to become life, co life coaches. So got to, got busy with some friends and they helped me to write the curriculum. A lot of it came out of my doctoral dissertation, uh, wrote on the topic of hope and change and coaching. And mm. so it was quite a bit in there and it kind of all just flowed together as God you does a lot of times a convergence of what happens in your life. Just, you know, just yeah. have to be there. So we've had the business for 10 years and this year we became, um, a, a, with the ICF, the international coach federation, which is the premier coaching agency in the world. And, um, our curriculum is approved, and so just a lot of great accomplishments for ten years in being in business. And that's great. Seeing people, I, I was gonna say, I was gonna say, Brenda. I, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I was gonna say, I, you know, one of the things that I've noticed, especially in the season, a lot of people have taken advantage of this season to really yeah. uh, improve their themselves, find new ways of of growing and learning. And maybe you can speak a little bit about, you know, somebody who's hearing about, well, what is this dream releaser coaching? Who, who is that for? Who is that targeted to? Who can be a part of that? Yes. Uh, the short answer on that is everyone. Everyone. <laughs> if you enjoy learning and if you enjoy um, self-development and that type of thing, literally it's for everyone. But it's for anybody who wants to become a better teacher, a better um supervisor, a better pastor, mm. a better parent, even a uh, better leader, communicator. You want to understand yourself and others better. Anyone who feels stuck. So it, it virtually it, it's for anyone. Um, and not the least to say to become a life coach <laughs> in the end. And so we've had all types of people come through the program for all sorts of reasons, but there is a, in our program, there is a uh, self-awareness portion where you just learn about yourself. It took me so long in life to figure out my identity, who I was. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I was raised in an environment where, uh, you know, if someone would raise their hand, you would, you would dodge because you, you thought you were going to get it or something. Right. You know? And so I, Someone described me to my uh, one time as you act like someone who's walking around apologizing for being alive. And so it took me so many years to figure out my identity and cut through so many things. And coaching just helps you to become self-aware, cut mm. through all that stuff, 
faster go through the process you know you can't really speed up a process when god had you as you in one but speed up you know where you're at and where you're stuck at and why you don't dream anymore and what dream is inside of you coaching helps you to do that it's like if you were in a mall and there's a there's a map of all the stores in the mall and you see that dot in the middle that says you are here (laughs) <laughs> and sometimes you have to know you are here before you can get over to Macy's and Dillard's and all the wonderful <laughs> places that you want to go. So figure out self-aware you are here and you want to get over there. So coaching helps you to um, come up with steps, action steps, and you find accountability in the way that you want to have accountability. How much, how little or how 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 much you want to have to what level and figure out a way to get there. Only the answers within yourself and you've got to be the one to figure it out. The dreams within yourself. All the coach has to do is ask questions and be curious. Yeah. Would you say, you know, what, what kind of difference would you say does it make in a person's life leadership when they actually open the door to a coach to come speak in kind of on the other side, not, not speaking to the coach, but speaking to somebody who says, I don't know if coaching would help me. What, what would you say? What, what value is added when there's a coach coming in to a, to a person's life? I think it makes all the difference in in the world, especially like in my case where, you know, I didn't really have any mentor or or anything uh, coming along. I think you, you can get along quicker with Hmm. goals and dreams. Yeah. I've had, we've had people that uh, they get their books written because someone's had them, a coach has walked them with them through action steps and uh, setting the, first of all, setting their own goals and then action steps. And what are you going to have by the time we talk next Friday? You know, that type of thing. They don't (laughs) hound them and they're only as uh, forceful as they're asked to be, you know. Right. But if, if you hired me to help you get through this book, then that's what we're going to do, you know, kind of thing. That's good. I love that. Did Did you ever think, uh, you know, years maybe before stepping into that role, did you ever think you'd be a coach or you'd help coaches become coaches? Uh, no, I would have, you know, I would have <laughs> never thought, thought that. Now, mentoring, I was, um, you know, I had already settled into mentoring yeah. and and that's that's a bit of a different thing you know you're just a little bit further yeah. than someone else so you help them to come up um just a little bit and so that's a totally different thing for sure well you know for somebody who says you know what i'm interested in hearing more about uh, uh dream release or coaching and knowing more about when the you know online when's the next online you know coaching uh, video coming on or when can i where can i go to see more about this uh brenda where could people find out more information about dream release or coaching oh uh, it would be best to go to the website which is dreamreleaser.com dreamreleaser.com dream and yeah I'm, debbie's gonna kill me but right offhand i don't know the next summit but uh, we're, <laughs> we're starting our, our new uh, track, January 11th. So it's, it's coming right up. This, this Excellent. Well, week. they can go to dreamreleaser.com and it's get all, all the information. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Awesome. I, I want to recommend it to every leader who's uh, watching this or listening to this podcast. If you have never done any kind of coaching, um, a course, I really want to highly recommend checking out Dream Release or Coaching. It could be a great blessing and benefit, not only for your life personally, that you're going to, but uh, through you, it could be a blessing to a lot of people if this is something the Lord has for you. So dreamreleaser.com. Um, before we kind of hit the final stretch here, Brenda, I want to talk about the Avail Journal. I am holding here in my hand, the most recent, it's fresh, hot off the press, January 2021. This is the uh, new Avail Journal. As we say here, every podcast, the Avail Journal is an amazing resource. It's a beautiful resource for leaders, for uh, Christian leaders. Uh, uh, Brenda, what would you say to people out there who maybe haven't seen, haven't held one in their hands? What do you think about the Avail Journal? I think it's got a great look. I think it's a beautiful um, compiling of 
of uh, a lot of leaders, hard work, uh, and, and you get the benefit of their journey. You get the benefit of each and every one of their journey. Um, it's got a lot of variety in it, a lot of interesting articles, very informative. I love to look at it because there's a lot of our friends are, are in the uh, journal, get to look at it, see what everybody's up to. And even if they're not close friends, they're mentors from afar, that type of thing. Um, distance mentors, my uh, mentoring uh, instructor used to talk about. And so it's there, it's available, and I believe it's free. Yeah, we're actually offering, now that you say that, we're offering a one a free one-year subscription. Uh, you can claim that free one-year subscription to the Avail Journal by going to availjournal.com, A-V-A-I-L, availjournal.com. Get a free one-year subscription. And just like you said, uh, Brenda, it's amazing leadership content. Uh, it's beautiful. It's, it's, it's so excellent and it's so vibrant that you don't want it. This is not like a kind of like a magazine that you just kind of throw away. You just want to keep it because it's so, so good. Yeah. Um, great, great articles, great, great leaders. And so make sure if you have not yet done so, availjournal.com, you can claim your free annual subscription to the Avail Journal. Uh, Brenda, I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation, Brenda, because personally, generosity is something that impassions me as well. Uh, um, I love I love what I've been learning about dream release or coaching, which you know you've been talking a little bit about. I love the idea of helping people, right? Um, but as we close this podcast out, what are some final thoughts, some uh, last comments you want to share with everybody who's listening in? Well, I want to close with a quote from Warren Buffett, who said, "Someone is sh- is sitting under a shade tree today because someone planted a tree." A long time ago. And I think wow. that speaks to the topic of generosity. You know, we plant a tree and it takes years, years, years for it to grow. And it benefits not you, but someone else. But wow. So I want to challenge us today with how many trees are we planting? How many trees are we planting for someone else to, to for someone else to be able to sit under after we're, hmm. you know, after I, we, we're gone. Are we planting trees for our own future so that we can sit under a shade tree when we, when we want to retire? So you got to remember yourself. You got to remember to do that for yourself way back as early as possible and then do it for others, do it forward. Um, you know, when all is said and done and we play that, we end that game called life, um, sometimes you go do a funeral and, and people will either think or question, I wonder how much they left behind. And the answer is they left behind everything. We don't mm-hmm. take anything with us. So I encourage everyone today, you're not going to take it with you. Charles Swindoll once said um, he's never seen a hearse pulling a U-Haul behind it. You just, you know, you're in the hearse, you're in the box by yourself. So you leave everything behind. And so just remember, um, none of us are going to take any of it it with us. So just be generous along this journey and remember to help others succeed. I love that illustration. Um, I think it's, I think that's God's heart when we learn to live, uh, not for ourselves, but when we live beyond ourselves, transcendence, legacy, you know, those are the words that come to my mind. And I think that's exactly the picture you've helped us paint today. Uh, Brenda, what a blessing. Thank you for taking this time uh, with us on behalf of the Avail Leadership Team. We just want to say we honor you, Brenda. Uh, we, th- we know that uh, you know, the, the, the saying goes, uh, behind every great man, there's a great woman, you know, uh, <laughs> the reality is that is a very, very true statement. And we believe that what God is doing through your life, uh, through your family and through the organizations that you're leading and helping to lead, um, it's making a great impact. So, so Brenda, we honor you. I honor you. I thank you for your leadership, for your courage, for being willing to do many things along the journey that are now today 
we're seeing the sh- we're we're receiving the shade from the seeds that you and Sam have planted throughout the years, and that's a great blessing. So please receive on behalf of our team and everybody connected to Avail. Uh, we're so thankful for your life, and we bless you. Thank you so much, and blessings to you, Pastor Virgil. Thank you, Brenda. Hey, everybody, thank you for connecting with us on another Avail Leadership podcast. Uh, What a great conversation we've had here with uh, Dr. Brenda Chand, and what a great opportunity to learn more about generosity. Remember, every week we're bringing out new content, so stay connected with us here at the Avail Leadership podcast. We hope you've been inspired by this conversation with Brenda Chand. You can learn more about Dream Releaser Coaching by going to dreamreleaser.com. For more leadership resources, check us out at theartofleadership.com. And if you haven't done so yet, make sure to claim your free annual subscription of the Avail Journal by going to availjournal.com. As always, thank you for connecting with us to learn the art of leadership here at the Avail Leadership Podcast.